fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. Good morning and welcome to my father's place. This is the study of Isaiah called Return to the Lord, and we are in chapters 17 and 18 today. 17 dealing with Damascus and Syria. Damascus is the capital of Syria. And the other dealing with Cush. And the thing that you need to know about these is they also pertain to God's judgment of all who defy him. So the title, if I were going to give it one, of this particular message and teaching is The Lord Will Judge Those Who Defy Him. And so his people defied him, he judged them. Peoples of other nations defied him, he judged them. So, I'll pray and we'll begin. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for sending Isaiah to speak this to God's people then and to speak this to God's people today, even the church. Thank you that you are faithful to your word, which is a delightful thing to hear for those who obey you and love you and adore you, who worship and revere you and fear you, who follow you with all their hearts. And not such a delightful word for those who disobey you and defy you. Jesus, thank you for sending your spirit and filling me with him so that he could teach me the things I needed to know in order to do this today. Thank you for the others with whom I have consulted in commentaries who also hear from you so that I could be as clear as possible in the message that you want to give for all that I teach is a message. This whole word is a message. Holy Spirit, have your way as I speak, I pray in Jesus name. Amen. His whole word is a message. It is a message to his people and by way of his people, it is a message to the world. We are to be Christ's witnesses here, delivering the same message that I speak of. So, I want you to be careful to keep in mind that Jacob belonged to the Lord, that is, northern Israel, Ephraim. He's called many things. But it is northern Israel that is God's people. So God's people are not immune from God's judgment. Many today, even God's people, even the church, defy him. And he warns you today through Isaiah's prophecy. Now, chapter 17, I will read down through. We will also do 18, which is a short chapter. But I'll read 17, and then we'll talk about it. The Oracle Concerning Damascus. Behold, Damascus is about to be removed from being a city and will become a fallen ruin. The cities of Aroer are forsaken. They will be for flocks to lie down in and there will be no one to frighten them. The fortified city will disappear from Ephraim and sovereignty from Damascus and the remnant of Aram. They will be like the glory of the sons of Israel, declares the Lord of hosts. Now in that day, the glory of Jacob will fade and the fatness of his flesh will become lean. It will be even like the reaper gathering the standing grain as his arm harvests the ears, or it will be like one gleaning 
ears of grain in the valley of Rephaim. Verse 6, yet gleanings will be left in it like the shaking of an olive tree, two or three olives on the topmost bough, four or five on the branches of a fruitful tree, declares the Lord, the God of Israel. In that day, man will have regard for his maker and his eyes will look to the Holy One of Israel. He will not have regard for the altars, the work of his hands, nor will he look to that which his fingers have made, even the ashram and incense stands. In that day, their strong cities will be like forsaken places in the forest or like branches which they abandoned before the sons of Israel, and the land will be a desolation. For you have forgotten the God of your salvation and have not remembered the rock of your refuge. Therefore, you plant delightful plants and set them with vine slits of a strange God. In the day that you plant, you carefully fence in, and in the morning you bring your seed to blossom, but the harvest will be a heap in a day of sickliness and incurable pain. Verse 12, alas, the uproar of many peoples who roar like the roaring of the seas and the rumbling of nations who rush on like the rumbling of mighty waters. The nations rumble on like the rumbling of many waters, but he will rebuke them and they will flee far away and be chased like chaff in the mountains before the wind or like whirling dust before a gale at evening time. Behold, there is terror before morning. They are no more. Such will be the portion of those who plunder us and the lot of those who pillage us. Not a good word for Damascus or for any who defy the Lord. Not a good word for Ephraim in here either. So again, Damascus is the capital of Syria with whom northern Israel and Jacob, well, northern Israel or Jacob or Ephraim, however you want to call it, had allied themselves. They had allied themselves with Syria in order to defeat Judah, remember, from Isaiah 7. But they would not succeed, and the Lord would ultimately destroy both Syria and Jacob, that is Ephraim, as Isaiah prophesied in both 7.1 and 7.8. Now Isaiah gives an oracle, which is both a word and a vision of Syria's pending destruction, and also of Ephraim's. He sees that Syria's capital, Damascus, is about to be removed as a city and will become a fallen ruin at the hands of Assyria. The city of Aroer is forsaken. Its only inhabitants are flocks of animals who use the buildings as a safe haven lying down in them. No one frightens them away, for the city is abandoned. There's no one there anymore. It's empty. As empty as the gods they worship. And in idolatrous Ephraim, there will be no fortified cities anymore. And there will be no sovereignty from Damascus. There will be no king of Syria. And the remnant of Aram? The remnant of Syria? No. Assyria will rule them. This next couple of lines in verse 3 are sarcasm from the Lord. They will be like the glory of the sons of Israel, declares the Lord of hosts. Now, this glory in this case is that they will be a faint shadow. Both Ephraim and Syria will be faint shadows 
there will be only a few that remain in the land. And I tell you the truth, that those who worship idols, including the idol of self, which rules and reigns in much of today's church, for the gospel has been changed into one that is what God is going to do for you, not how you need a new heart from God. Those who worship idols, including the idol of self, boast about themselves and glorify themselves. But at the end of, the, at the end of things, their glory will vanish. And that right quick, quickly. Together they will be crushed. They will be crushed, declares the Lord of hosts, the captain of the armies of the Lord. Surely that will be the fate of all who defy him, rebel against him and refuse to repent. Even those who are his people and his church, they will be crushed. Again, how does the church defy him? By following the strange gospel that is preached and by those who greedily seek the Lord for what they declare he should do for them. Beloved, it's a strange gospel. And in following it, you defy the Lord. In the day when the Lord crushes Jacob, his glory will fade, it will be thin and feeble. Again, a faint shadow is in view. And Jacob will no longer be fat, no longer be rich, and no longer be prosperous, but lean and famished. Verses 5 and 6. Isaiah sees a harvest. Assyria harvests Jacob. Because this is specifically 4, 5, and 6 about Jacob. And even beyond that, about Jacob. When grain is harvested, back in those days, the harvester would gather up the stalks, the heads of grain on top of the stalks, and he would put it under his arm and grasp it tightly and wrap it with rope and then whack it off, whack off the heads of grain. That's the picture the Lord wants you to see here. The Assyrians will cut and gather Jacob and then put them tightly in their arms and whack off their heads. There will be no fruit from Jacob. One sweeping cut is what is in view. Lack of fruit is what is in view. And I wouldn't put it past them to have actually beheaded some. Gleanings will be gathered in the valley of Rephaim. Now that's just southwest of Jerusalem. What's this about? Well, if you recall from 2 Kings 19, Assyria comes to the very gate of Jerusalem. But as I've told you, they failed. King Hezekiah, who was faithful to the Lord, had not made any alliances with any of the nations that defied God. And so 185,000 Assyrians were killed in one night a sweeping cut. The Assyrians made a sweeping cut. So did the Lord, because it was his angel who destroyed them, and they returned home. And that's in 2 Kings 19.35. And gleanings will be left in Jacob, 
that is northern Israel, like the shaking, the striking of an olive tree. They would strike the branches and the olives would fall. And the Assyrian harvesters will beat those branches. They will beat Ephraim. They will beat him thoroughly so that all that is left may be two olives on the top or on a very fruitful branch, five. Who declares this last line of six? Declares the Lord, the God of Israel. He declares it. He is God alone. There is no other. And no one can reverse his judgments upon his rebellious people who have refused to repent and upon all who defy him who are in the world. Verses 7 and 8. This pertains to northern Israel. In that day man will have regard for his maker and his eyes will look to the Holy One of Israel. In the day that the Lord judges Ephraim, man will have regard for his maker instead of the things he makes. The idols they make with their hands. Their idols are emptiness and nothing, for they make them. Anything humans make with their hands is emptiness and nothing. And the God of Israel will judge such ones, for he is Lord of all the earth. Some will look to him. They will have regard for him. All who have worshipped the God of self, the ones who want the Lord to bless them while they defy him, will have regard at the end of things, but it will be too late. While it is still today, repent. For he certainly will receive you if you repent and ask him to forgive you and ask him to give you a new heart. That thing that's not spoken in the church today. While it is still today, repent. Ephraim is overrun. There are just a few stragglers left in the land. Now, instead of looking to their idols and their false gods, they stop looking at what their fingers have made, even the ashram. Now, these are wooden idols that are representative of the mother of Baal, Asherah. And to that which is, uh, and to incense stands. These are the stands upon which they burned incense to Baal. They will finally see that Baal and the golden calves that were at, at Bethel and at Dan, both ends of Israel, are emptiness and foolishness. They will look to the Lord and they will finally see that there is no salvation in what they have worshipped. Those who have worshipped a false Jesus at the end of things, those who have worshipped a false Jesus, one who does not command them to be holy by being filled with the Holy Spirit, from Luke 24, 49 and Acts 1, 4 and 5, will see that they have been listening to false prophets who appeal to their greed. They will see that they have worshipped the God of self 
but it will be too late. Repent now, while it is still today, while it is still possible to return to the Lord. Verses 9 and 10. In that day, the strong cities of northern Israel will be like forsaken places in the forest or branches which they abandoned before the sons of Israel. Now, what does that mean? Certainly, forsaken places in the forest, places where false gods used to be worshipped. But what are the abandoned branches? I checked this out in the Expositor's Bible Commentary and learned that these are the abandoned buildings. When Israel went in to possess the land, those they drove out abandoned the buildings that they were in and Israel lived in those buildings. But now the tables are turned and Israel is going to be driven out and there will simply be abandoned buildings where they were. Those will be taken up by those who Assyria has captured from other nations and now scatters across northern Israel. And the land will be a desolation that is laid waste by Assyria. Why? Verse 10. They've forgotten their God. Like Ephraim, today's church is overrun by the God of self, the God of this world, by her enemy, Satan. Many abandoned buildings have been bought for the use of the world system that defies God. And all those abandoned buildings stand as a sign to the church, a witness against her. They have forgotten their God, just like Ephraim. They've forgotten the one that saved them from slavery to Egypt, we have forgotten the one who wants to save you from slavery to sin and says he will do it. John 8, 31 through 36, beloved. We have forgotten him. Like Ephraim, we've sought shelter and refuge in false gods and in alliances with the world, just as they have tried to ally with, it, with Syria. We have done this instead of seeking refuge in the Lord, who is the rock of our refuge, our strength. And David sought refuge in him and no other from Psalm 18 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my fortress. Beloved, you cannot say that and not be following him. You cannot say that and be disobeying him, because if you are disobeying him, you're chasing after something else which has become your God. You are not trusting in him, but in that which you chase after. What is your foundation? In whom do you trust? He says, my fortress, my deliverer, my rock, my shield, the horn of my salvation, the strength of my salvation, my stronghold. What is your foundation? In whom do you trust? Is it the Lord? Is it the Lord? Or is it the words of this strange gospel that Jesus hears and wonders at, though he prophesied of it in Matthew 24 and elsewhere. 
Do you claim to be his and yet disobey him? Listen to Jesus' warning. Matthew 7, 24 through 25. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, that is, does them, may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. My rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. But after that, he said, some built their foundation on sand, on false teaching and their fall was great when the winds came and the floods came. So Ephraim suffers because they have rejected the Lord who planted them. And instead they have planted the vine slips of a false god that has spread all through Ephraim. Same vine slips have been planted in the church. And the vine is spreading, beloved. Vine slips of a strange god. Some... 81, 8 and 9. Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you. O Israel, if you would listen to me, says the Lord, let there be no strange God among you, nor shall you worship any foreign God. So Isaiah sees in this vine slips of a strange God and planting and carefully fencing in, and uh, you see the seed, you see the blossom, but he says, oh, it's not going to come to fruit. I'll cut it off. He sees a vision of Ephraim's futile efforts as they plant emptiness and foolishness. With their own hands, they carefully fence it in and tend it. Ephraim sees the blossoms that promise coming fruit, but the harvest will be a heap at the hands of the Lord, mounded up and spoiled. In a day of sickness and incurable pain. He judges them for they have refused to repent for their idolatry. Vine slips of a strange God. Spreading throughout today's church, beloved. Beware a gospel is being taught that is strange to Jesus Christ's ears. Verses 12 through 14. Alas, woe, Isaiah hears the uproar of many peoples. What is it? This is the army, the Assyrian army coming. They roar like the roaring of the seas. Their armies are vast, comprised of Assyrians and soldiers from lands they have conquered. Assyria has conquered, and therefore their army is so great that they make a rumbling noise, like a rumbling of mighty waters. They are a mighty army. Again, Isaiah hears them like the rumbling of many waters. When the Lord does a prophecy where he repeats twice, it's going to happen soon. Anyone who hears them will be terror-stricken. The armies of Assyria will Rumble on, unstoppable. But ultimately, the Lord will rebuke them, those armies, and they will flee far away. They will get their due punishment at the hands of Babylon. They will be chased upon the mountains and will blow to and fro like chaff in the wind. They will be helpless confused, going every which way, trying to escape. They will no longer march in the order of which they were so very proud. They will flee this way and that, seeking safety. 
They will be chased, surrounded, and blinded by the flying dust from Babylon's many foot soldiers, horses, and chariots. Isaiah sees that mighty Assyria is terror-stricken at evening. Verse 14. Before morning, they are no more. This is like what happened when they were at Jerusalem's walls and were destroyed in a night. But even more so, the whole world system will be destroyed like that by the Lord. Their armies will assemble and the Lord will destroy without having to lift his finger. Do we not realize how powerful he is? Is that why we are planting vine slips of a strange God? How can we ask him to defeat Satan for us when we worship ourselves? But ultimately, Satan will meet his end. He has plundered and pillaged the church and continues at quite a fast clip. But he will ultimately be destroyed in the lake of fire at the end of things. A bitter end indeed. Such will be his portion. Now there's a message to Ethiopia. Really, this Kush is comprised of Ethiopia, Somalia, and the Sudan. And they also have defied the Lord. Woe to them. Their punishment is just as thorough as that of Assyria and Ephraim. So Isaiah says, alas, that is, woe, O land of whirring wings. In that area, the area of Cush, there were many flying insects. Which lies beyond the rivers of Cush. Historically, Cush was frequently ruled by Egypt. But now... Assyria has become a threat to Cush. So Isaiah sees these swift messengers. I'll read the verse. Cush, which sends envoys by the sea, even in papyrus vessels on the surface of the waters, go swift messengers to a nation tall and smooth, to a people feared far and wide, a powerful and oppressive nation whose land the rivers divide. That's a description of Cush. Isaiah sees Cush send swift envoys, and this is from the Expositor's Bible Commentary. I wanted to understand who was being spoken of here. They will send swift envoys by boat to Judah to seek an alliance with Judah to gather as many nations as they can so that they can resist Assyria's onslaught. They travel up the Nile on lightweight craft, so they're able to move swiftly across the water. They travel swiftly to Judah. Judah refuses the alliance, and Cush swiftly returns to their land. They are desperate and in grave danger. Cush is the land where the tall, handsome, clean-shaven Nubians dwell. That's why, to a nation tall and smooth, to a people feared far and wide, they were. They had even conquered Egypt. But now they were fleeing and seeking refuge, sending ambassadors, help us. The Lord did not fear Cush, Neither did Judah, because at that time, King Hezekiah 
faithful to the Lord, would have nothing to do with making an alliance with any who defied God. There are a few Hezekiahs left in the church who cling to the Lord and follow him and him alone and have not made an alliance with the world system that defies him. Verses 3 and 4. All you inhabitants of the world and dwellers on earth, as soon as the standard is raised on the mountains, you will see it, and as soon as the trumpet is blown, you will hear it. For thus the Lord has told me, I will look from my dwelling place quietly like dazzling heat in the sunshine, like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. This not only speaks of a serious fall, of Syria's fall, of Ephraim's fall, of the fall of those who denied and rebelled against him in the days of Isaiah, but also the end of things when all the inhabitants of the world and dwellers on earth, you will see that used many times in the book of Revelation, earth dwellers, inhabitants of the earth, those who have defied him and persecuted and slain believers, true believers. But they will fall. The inhabitants of the world and dwellers on earth will fall. They will see. In the days of Assyria, the demise of them will be seen. The demise of Ephraim will be seen. The demise of Cush will be seen. But ultimately, the demise of all who defy him will be seen. The whole known earth will see the demise of those who have defied the Lord. At the end of things, martyred believers who have been murdered because of their faith will cry out to the Lord from beneath the altar in heaven. Revelation 6.10, And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, wilt thou refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? The blood of those who defy God and kill his people the blood of the ones they kill is upon them. O Cush, O inhabitants of the earth who defy the Lord, O believer who has defied the Lord and has taken up worship of self, this strange gospel, this strange vine slip, repent. My heart is still today. There will be a standard raised. Cush will see it. The Assyrians will attack them. You will hear a trumpet sound in Cush that announces the beginning of the battle. But at the end of the thing, so end of things, those who defy the Lord will see the banner of the righteous judge, Jesus Christ, and will hear the battle cry of the armies of heaven. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, that is, crowns. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is God, and there is 
no other. That is a description of God the Son at the end of things. Thus the Lord has told Isaiah, the Lord will quietly look upon the destruction of those who have defied him and refused to repent. He has judged them, and now from on high he stretches out, just watches as his judgment unfolds. He dwells in unapproachable light where he speaks of, I will look on from my dwelling place quietly like dazzling heat in the sunshine, that is light. He dwells in unapproachable light, and that is from 1 Timothy 6.16. His light is so bright that like dazzling heat, it is not only bright and plainly seen, but hot. His light can be felt. It is so strong and so powerful. But all those who defy him have refused his light. They will see, but they have refused, so they will perish. He's like a cloud of dew which would have given them shelter from the heat of their spiritual deserts, but they have refused his shelter. They have refused his light. They have refused his shelter. And now he watches as his judgment of them unfolds. Verses 5 and 6. For before the harvest, as soon as the bud blossoms and the flower becomes a ripening grape, then he will cut off the sprigs with pruning knives and remove and cut away the spreading branches. They will be left together for mountain birds of prey and for the beasts of the earth. And the birds of prey will spend the summer feeding on them and all the beasts of the earth will spend harvest time on them. Before the harvest, as soon as the bud blossoms and the flower becomes a ripening grape, the Lord cut off sprigs with pruning knives of Assyria, of Ethiopia, of Cush of the Sudan, of the Somalians, of all who defy him, of, of every one who defies him, he will cut off, cut them off. The vine dresser from John 15, one will cut off Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, before he can bear the fruit of further nations conquered. He will ruin Assyria's harvest and he will cut away and remove all the places where the Assyrian empire has spread. At the end of things, he will do the same to Satan and all who follow him, all the earth dwellers who have defied God. All of those who claim his name but defy him and worship self. It will be such a huge number of dead bodies. This must, by its very description of not only being all summer long, but all harvest time as well, this must be more than just the Assyrian army, and indeed it is. The beasts of the earth and the birds of prey will eat them, the slaughter will be so great that it will last this very long time, just as at the end of things, Revelation 19, 17 through 18. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid-heaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, in order that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them in the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, and small and great, all who defy him. (laughs) 
Verse 7, at that time, a gift of homage will be brought to the Lord of hosts from a people tall and smooth, even from a people feared far and wide, a powerful and oppressive nation whose land the rivers divide to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, even Mount Zion. And this surely is at the end of things. The people tall and smooth, nation feared far and wide, is a remnant of Cush. And they will come to Judah. But listen. Who will give honor to whom at the end of things? Even those who have defied the Lord will come and bow down. Philippians 2, 9 and 10. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him, that is Jesus Christ, the name which is above every other name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess, verse 11, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This will be before they go to their judgment, before they are sentenced. They will have to agree that Jesus Christ is Lord. So what should be the response of nations and of all humankind? What should be the response of believers who hear this word and say, I have been worshiping the vine slips of a strange God, I have been worshiping myself. Oh God, oh Jesus, forgive me. I'm turning away from that. That should be your response. As David prophesies and warns from Psalm 2.1 through 3, he speaks of the nations and all those who defy God. Why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a vain thing? It's emptiness, foolishness. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, that is Christ, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. We're not going to pay any attention to the one true God. We'll make our own. Psalm 2.4 through 5. He who sits in the heavens laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king, Jesus Christ, upon Zion, my holy mountain, the heavenly Zion. And then he says, now therefore, in Psalm 2.10 through 12, now therefore, O kings, this must be your response to this word. Show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth, leaders. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son. Do homage to the Son. At that time, a gift of homage will be brought to the Lord of hosts, the captain of the armies of God, Jesus Christ. Worship the Lord. Do homage to the Son so that he will not become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled while it is still today. Turn. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. How blessed will you be if this very day you take refuge in him and throw to the moles and bats all the foolishness that you have been worshiping and ask him to kill the sin nature in you that loves you and not him and that Satan readily uses to lead you astray. If you repent and ask him to change your heart, he will surely do it. And that is very, very good news. Lord, may there be ears to hear the very, very good news and the warnings both 
Your people are not immune to your judgment. May they turn back to you. I pray in your name. Amen. The fields are white and the workers are few, but the Lord of the harvest is faithful and true. He'll send forth more workers to accomplish his plan and pour out his spirit.